And this is right out of the Constitution. The people have the right to defend themselves by any means necessary. Look at where we're at now. Right, exactly. Well, and, and people, people judging the response of people right now, instead of first jumping to, you shouldn't be doing it that way, in my mind should be opening up and thinking, like, what is driving you to act this way? Right. That, I think that should be our first response. And I, it speaks to this idea that to be humble and not have to know the truth and be willing to change, and that you said this, that the Constitution, if it wasn't written with that in mind, wouldn't have been amended 27 times already. <laughs> right, right. Even written, and people defending like that. Uh, yeah, it's just, there's a lot of hypocrisy there. Yeah. And, and even in the way that people, a lot of these people were ready to, Revolt after two months in quarantine mm. over a and, haircut. Oh yeah, <laughs> over a haircut. Over a haircut. That's so. And even to the back to the Boston Tea Party. Yeah, it was a riot and destruction of property in the name of freedom. Well, and look at the racism there. They dressed themselves as Native Americans so that they could blame it on the Native Americans. When they went on the boat and threw the tea overboard, they had on they had. Uh, Native American feathers and headdresses on and stuff on their skin to look like red skin because mm. they were going to blame it on the Native Americans. Yeah. Because they didn't see the Native, the, the very Native Americans that taught the pilgrims how to uh, plant corn and survive in a land that they didn't know. And they used their image to gain their freedom. And then to go you one further, the whole Boston Tea Party you don't have without Crispus Attucks. You know, do you, do you know Crispus Attucks? You ever heard of his his name? I've heard the name, but I could Crispus Attucks. Crispus Attucks was a member or a part of that group that later on became known as the Sons of Liberty. Okay, yeah. He was one of those, and he was of Black and Native American descent. I believe maybe Cherokee. I'm not exactly sure, but he was Black and Native American. And as far as I understand, I believe he was a freed black man. He was a free black person, but he was part of the Sons of Liberty. And at the Boston Massacre, a year prior, I believe, or two years prior to the American Revolution, he was the first one to die from British fire in the Boston Massacre. He was the first one to fall and die. So the first patriot, the first American to give their life for their country wasn't George Washington. It was a black man, Crispus Attucks. And he's rarely talked about. He's rarely... I, I had to get a book that my, my aunt actually gave me a book on black history that, un, that helped unravel the lies that I had been told in school growing up. You know, uh, let's take February, for instance. February is Black History Month. Black history is American history. We built the country. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like make no mistake about it. We built the country. Okay. Uh, slaves didn't just do field work. Slaves were involved in building things, manufacturing. They were factory workers. Yeah. You know, Thomas Jefferson's plantation, uh, Monticello, he had slaves working there building shoes, manufacturing instruments. They knew this stuff. They, they, they knew how to build things with their hands. It wasn't just work in the fields. Mm. You know, the first eighth that the cotton, not the cotton gin, but um, some of the farming implements. Even if some, the, the first truly American instrument is a banjo. And that was made by black people. Yeah. Where you take some cat gut <laughs> mm -hmm. and string it along a turtle shell. And then you poke holes in the turtle, a hollowed out turtle shell, and you stick a stick through the end and you pitch the cat gut strings to one end on the peg of the stick and the other end of the turtle shell. And they only had three, but they strummed it. Well, and it's, I guess, like a recreation of, of an African instrument. They were doing yeah. the best they could. Yeah. With the resources. They were recreating what they couldn't have from Africa, that they were denied drums. Mm -hmm. So they sent signals. And that ties back into what we're saying about music. They weren't allowed their instruments. They weren't allowed their expression. So they had to make one of their own. And it had to speak a language right past the slave master's consciousness. Consciousness, Because he's thinking he's hearing a pretty, you know, play me that little pretty melody on that little guitar thing you got. Mm -hmm. 
Meanwhile, he don't know <laughs> that, you know, Fiddler over there is playing on a banjo and he's sending a code to his buddies out there in the field to say, tonight we going out to the corner church mm. and we're going to hide under the basement. Mm. Maybe he sung a song, you know, follow the drinking gourd while he was strumming the banjo. Who knows? Yeah. But that's the way we sent the codes. Mm. That's the way the Underground Railroad, uh, Railroad worked. So, I mean, black history is American history. We have to remove this idea that we need to set aside a month you don't set aside one month for something that's already part of your history. Just study your history. Yeah. You know, there is no such thing in America as black history in, in terms of, you know, black blacks are, are doing their thing and whites are doing their thing. No, blacks have always made things that have benefited white society. And that is that is American. Mm -hmm. That's the American truth. You know, um, uh, Madam C.J. Walker, Ida B. Wells. You know, Sojourner Truth, um, you know, Angela Davis, Maya Angelou, Langston Hughes, all these people have contributed to American culture, not just black culture, American culture. Jazz. Louis Armstrong is the J.S. Bach of jazz. Mm -hmm. Period. Period. Everything goes back to him. Um, Give you a prime example. Like, so, I mean, because you play, you know, you play drums and stuff. You study jazz, right? Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to see if you know where this is from. I'm going to try to sing a little bit of it. Let's see if I can get Yeah, it's the West End Blues. Right. The, the intro. Right. That's the Bible to jazz because yeah. it's the first solo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the first recorded solo. So without, to, to put it this way, who's the, who's the big, who's one of the big, Michael Brecker, let's say, for example. You don't have Michael Brecker without Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have John McLaughlin without Charlie Christian. You don't have Chet Baker without Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. You don't have, uh, Bill Evans without Winton Kelly, who I just learned recently was Jamaican. Mm. And that we've been mispronouncing his name the whole time. Yeah, did not know that. It's not Winton Kelly, it's Winton Kelly, okay. Jamaican. Yeah. That a lot of these dudes that we uh, hear, uh, there was another musician, and, and, and thank you, I'm going to shout out Parker Swinson, because he, he, Parker Swinson, told me this. So even I can be educated at knowing as much black history as I know. Even I can be educated. He told me this. I didn't know this. But Winton Kelly was a Caribbean. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you, you, don't get, you don't get Bill Evans without Winton Kelly or Red Garland or um, uh, Jelly Roll Morton. Mm -hmm. Scott Joplin, which you don't get him without Scott Joplin. You know? Yeah. Da, 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 da. Not, that's the entertainer. What's the other one? The Maple Leaf Rag. Scott yeah, okay. Joplin. Mm -hmm. that, that is pre-jazz right there. Right? So black history is American history. You don't have one without the other. You know, Even in terms of the Amer the, what I just described, the American Revolution, you don't have one without the other. You don't have George Washington without Christmas Addicts. Mm -hmm. You know, and in fact, I would even argue white people should understand that more because one of your greatest founding fathers was not born on American soil. You know who I'm talking about? Help me out. Okay, most of the listeners may know this. How does a bastard orphan son of mm. a whore and a. Yeah. You okay. know? Yeah. Alexander Hamilton was not born on the American mainland. He was born, he, he was a Scottish heritage. And he was born, I believe, in, um, I, well, I know he was raised in Nevis. I want to say it was St. Croix, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. But he was raised in Nevis. And it was his writing ability that took him to the mainland. His ability to, to his ability to lend voice to frustration of the poor was what got him to America. Because... Had he not written that essay about how 
the people that he lived with on, on Nevis were devastated by the hurricane and how they didn't have resources. That essay is what sent him to America. Because mm. people were like, he's sick with a pen. Send him, send him to get an education. Yeah. And now you're talking about the dude, excuse me, who, um, he's not American and he's not one of the great old, he's not one of the grand old Virginians, you know, like James Madison or Thomas Jefferson or, or George Washington, you know, but at the same time, this is the guy who invented our financial system. Yeah. The guy on the 10, he's a white man, but he's, the, he's an immigrant. And he's always looked at as they made fun of him for it. They called him the immigrant, mm. the bastard immigrant. That's what they called him because he was not from the American mainland. And yet this guy, he, he invented our national bank. He invented our credit system. He, uh, he founded, uh, the, uh, New York post. So many things that he did our like I said, our financial system, how our money is, is, is minted. He invented that. He invented all of that. Washington, D.C. exists because of him. Mm. The Great Compromise of 1790. And the only reason I'm bringing him up is in the strictest sense of the word, we have 45 sitting in there denying immigrants because he's not educated. Mm -hmm. Den immigrants can't come into the country or we're going to build a wall to keep out certain immigrants. It's immigrants who built the country, whether voluntarily or by force. African Americans are forced immigrants. Why are we forced immigrants? We didn't ask to come here. We brought here. So we're forced immigrants and yet we built the country. The Latinos uh, from uh, who are, you know, dis in this country descended from the Aztec and the Olmec that later became, you know, the Mexicans. Mm -hmm. They built where we live where, technically, where we live now in Utah, this was Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> just to, I'm just putting it in perspective. You know what I mean? This used to be Mexico. And so America, and I, I think I wrote also in that same po post, again, to deprogram yourself, America is not becoming a brown country. America has always been a brown country. It's been built by brown people and black people. It's always been a brown country. The people that lived here before Amerigo Vespucci, whom this country is named after, got here, were brown people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's another thing, you know, like the euphemistic language has to be depro deprogrammed out of the educational process. We always like to say Dis uh, Columbus discovered America. No, he didn't. First of all, he didn't discover America. He discovered the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Secondly, how you discover some somebody I already live at? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, comedians have made jokes about that. They've said, you know, by that criteria, I'm going to go discover somebody's car and give them a reservation in the trunk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, the, the absurdity of the language, the, the language is even structured. I, I did the, I did the experiment. And those of you that are list that will listen to this, do this experiment with yourself. If you want to start the process to understanding how inherent racism is in America, this is what I want you to do. Go grab a dictionary. This is the simplest thing you can do. And it will, I will, I guarantee you, it will start the programmatic process in your head. I did this for myself. You go in the dictionary, look up the word black. Just look up the word black and find out how many adjectives in there denote evil character, denote foul play, denote anything that is dark and sinister and and, and all of the words that are associated with the word black that are evil intent, black male, black ball, black guard, you know, hmm. what that means is, is that through words, even that that's how sick the system is, even through common everyday vernacular English, certain white people in this country have given black people some 60 odd ways to denigrate and hate themselves. Then you go in the same dictionary and you look up the word white and you find hundreds of ways in which white is associated with everything that's pure, everything that's good, everything squared. I've even seen the words in there, square dealing and honorable. <laughs> I'm not saying that every white person has ill intent in their heart, 
But the power of the spoken word, and I mean, even for those that would consider themselves religious, always go, if you consider yourself, and I'm kind of bringing religion into play here, but if you consider yourself a religious person or that follows the Bible or reads the Bible, always remember that little scripture in, in there that says life and death is in the power of the tongue. What that means is what you speak against or towards yourself becomes reality. Mm. Yeah, We talk about spells. We talk about magic. Every time you speak, you're saying a spell. Yeah. You know? Because what you speak becomes. And so if we're dealing with a language that has given one group of people a hundred ways to glorify and edify themselves and at the same time has given another group of people 60 plus ways to, to hate themselves, you got to look at yourself and say, well, how deep does this really go? You know, maybe there is a privilege that I was born with that I wasn't just, I just wasn't aware of how it goes super deep. The, the racial complex goes really, really deep. And then I'll end it with this. The racial, the racial part of it is a byproduct of really what we're fighting right now, which is class warfare. The whole reason racism even exists in America in its current form is that before slavery, you had something called indentured servitude, which meant that whether you were white or black, if you had a debt that you couldn't pay off, you went into servitude and you were able to work that debt off, you know, and you could be free, debt free after X amount of years of working, whatever your debt was. The problem was that the treatment in indentured servitude was the same as in slavery. You got beatings. If you didn't do certain things right, you were treated less than, you know, you didn't have certain rights. And, and what happened was, is that poor blacks and poor whites who were indentured servants came together to revolt the system of that. And when they started revolting and started taking the, uh, the lives of their masters for the treatment, then the rich upper class who suffered that said, no, we can't have that. Because they'll, they'll, they'll chop all our heads off if we do that. So what we got to do is we despise the poor white man just as much as we do the poor black man. Not because of the color of their skin, but because they're poor. They're dirty. Mm. They do the work we don't want to do. And as a status symbol, they're lower than us. But what we got to do is we got to trick them into thinking that they're better than their poor black just because they're white. At least they look, they're, yeah, you're poor, but at least you look like us. That means you're part, of, you're part of the manifest destiny. And if you work really hard, you can share that manifest destiny with us. Well, now think about that. If you already are the richest 1%, how can they possibly work them, their, their way up to you? You've disenfranchised them just like you've disenfranchised poor black. But what it is, is you don't want them unifying with the poor blacks to overthrow you. Mm. So you put a system in place called... Uh, Black codes to say, if you're black, you get treated this way versus the poor white who can work his dead off. And we'll, we'll give him a little bit of, we'll give him, we'll give him just a little bit more respect than we give you. And pin poor whites more against black people than rich whites. Such that you have Trump supporters today who are poor work, working class or poor, poor whites they don't even know that they've been ramrodded. Mm. They don't even know that the man that they support despises them. Despises them to such a degree that at the same time he's telling them he's going to fight for them. Day by day, he's stripping more of their liberty away. We live, we live in a police state right now. We may as well say we don't have a president. He has abdicated the presidency. He is a dictator. A dictator, a president, let me say, let me put it, a president would not order the National Guard and the militarized police to go out there in his own backyard and literally steamroll the protesters there who are peaceably assembled, exercising their First Amendment rights, bulldoze them out of the way so I can go in front of the church and take a picture with a Bible in my hand, even though I don't pray to Christ and I don't go to church. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a dictator. And not only a dictator, that is a corporatist who can't stand you if you're poor, regardless of whether you're white or black. 
He can't stand you, but he's going to use the idea that has been implanted in you as a poor white person to say that you're white, therefore you're better. And he's still going to use that so that you can do his job for him, which is keep poor black folk in check. And the system goes on and on and on and on and on. So once we get to the place where we realize that the, the racial aspect is really a byproduct of class warfare, hmm. then you start to really understand what's going on here, you know? And it's always been, it's always been about class warfare. It's never, a, a, the racism is a byproduct of that. And it, it's, and it, it, it has always kind of been with us since, you know, the pilgrims landed, but only in the American experiment have we seen where racism has been used in quite this way to dominate every aspect of life for a group of people because you recognize in your guilt complex that you owe them too much. Mm. Uh, I have a feeling that at the root of what black people have been suffering, like George Floyd, Oscar, Oscar Grant, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, um, Breonna Taylor, the reason they're getting taken out now is because the the government, the, the upper echelons of power, know they owe black people too much. And so now it's just easier to get rid of them because they owe us too much. We built the country. And what do you do when, when a problem becomes too big? You just try to wipe it out. Rather than deal with it honorably, you try to wipe it out. And you use that wipeout to deflect from the real travesty, probably, which is the fact that, you know, while we're, uh, while we're killing black people indiscriminately, we're also using that as a smoke screen to slowly dissolve the United States. That, this is my, my own thinking on it, uh, uh, looking at the trajectory. Because I said a long time ago, back in 2016, when Donald Trump was running, I said... I, I believe I put a post that, you know, what really scares me about this is that he could turn the United States into Nazi Germany all over again. It'll be the 1930s all over again. And I remember people were telling me that I was crazy for thinking that. But if you're a person who really studies history <laughs> and you see how Hitler came to power, it's the same play out. It's the same play out. Mm. Um, the last thing that's left is to start putting people in internment camps. What's happening at the border? Because the thing about that is, is yeah, they're Latinos, but look at how many of the, those Latinos are dark skinned. Those babies that are being ripped from their parents. And which is, was also a practice in slavery. Remind, remember that, you know, black people were torn from their families. You know, we were the first victims of that. While everybody's talking about DACA and the dreamers and I get all that. It's sad and it should not happen ever. But always bear in mind that the first people that suffered that were black Americans. We were the first ones to have our babies ripped from us, our husbands torn from us, our wives taken away from us, never to be seen or heard from again. And it happened in public on auction blocks for price. We were actually sold for price. Even our birth certificates are, are, are collateral against us. <laughs> like it's 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 a sick it's a sick it's a sick thing and it seems like the more down the rabbit hole you go the deeper you find it it is it's more hurtful and it's like the only way that we escape it is to realize how how much we really really need each other hmm. you know black people need each other as a culture within a culture but we also need our white counterparts and their empathy and their willingness to recognize that they've had a head start on us in order for us to come together as working class people mm -hmm. to go against this, this, I don't even know what you call it. I, I can't even call it the Trump administration anymore. It's like the Trump algorithm. You know, I, I, <laughs> it, it is an algorithm. It's function because we can't call it leadership. It's functioning, but it's not functioning with somebody at the rudder. You know what I mean? Like, you know how like on Instagram you have 
you know, you type something and it becomes an algorithm that then has to operate without you overseeing it. Yeah, it's what I blame <laughs> the number of followers I have on. <laughs> right. It's like there's this hidden apparatus and the hidden apparatus is racism. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's class warfare and it's racism. That's the hidden apparatus. That's why Trump doesn't have to go out there and say a whole lot. Or or at the very least, he's saying what people have been thinking since Obama left. You know, if any, Obama's presidency brought to the forefront what black folks have already known. Martin, the, the dream of Dr. King has never been a dream. You know, and for black people in America, it's like Malcolm X said, there, there are not Malcolm, excuse me, Louis Farrakhan. It's what Louis Farrakhan, we've never experienced the American dream. We've experienced only the American nightmare. I think Malcolm maybe did say that. One of the two said it. But it hasn't been a dream. There, there has been no dream. There's been maybe a, a sedative. <laughs> you know, somebody, somebody got slipped some melatonin or something and, <laughs> and told to take a nap. But it's never really been a dream. Yeah. You know, there is no American dream. And maybe that could be the problem. We talk about it as a dream. What happens when you dream? Anything happens in a dream. A dream is a suspension of reality. If you if you really if you really think about that, I know I'm getting deep here, but if you really think about the dream, everybody's like, what about Martin Luther King's dream? What about the American dream? Well, in order for a dream to be real, you have to be asleep to believe it. Mm -hmm. That means your subconscious is at work and it's pulling, it's trying to deal with reality by suspending it. If we think, you ever think about that? Like when you're asleep and you're dreaming, it's your brain trying to process reality in a different way because it's receiving so much input, it can't process it all at once. So it needs eight hours to, 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 to uh, deal with it on a subconscious level. So your brain suspends reality so you can deal with reality. Mm. So a dream that maybe that's the point. It shouldn't be an American dream. It shouldn't be Dr. King's dream. It should just be the American reality. Yeah. Reality should be that if we are writing down that all men are created equal, all mankind is equal. Period. Period. That why does that have to be the American dream? Yeah, I feel like every time I <laughs> I say like in conversations like why isn't the reality what the dream is i'm called an idealist you know and i it's like but where's the logic in that right i was like why well why isn't the ideal scenario yeah like why can't we just make that the reality yeah and then that always comes across as absurd no dreams are absurd <laughs> If you need proof, just watch Ali watch the Disney movie Alice in Wonderland to find out how real a dream is. Because mm -hmm. everything that happened to Alice in there was wacky. Yeah. Like, matter of fact, the guy that wrote the book I've heard was on a L. Uh, what's the what's the drug? LSD. Yeah, he was on LSD when he was writing the book. <laughs> that checks out. That sounds about right. That explains. <laughs> so if you think about that, it's like, oh, well, yeah, that explains everything now. Now everything makes sense. So you need something to make sense. Um, it's like we are living in a matrix. And it's like there's a red pill and a blue pill. And you have to figure out which one you're going to take. But the dream, the whole idea of the dream, there is no dream. And I think black people are responding to that now. I, I've heard people... Ex black people express not in so many words, but kind of the general understanding right now. And the consensus is, is that we tried it Martin's way and God bless him. It didn't work. Mm. It didn't work because, and even Dr. King said to, to Harry Belafonte at one point, right after the civil rights act of 65 was passed, he said, I fear we've integrated our people into a burning house mm. because he understood what the real end goal is. And it's not the United States of America. <laughs> it's the as we've come to see little by little it's the united empire of earth <laughs> kind of kind of thing going on but i mean the dream it can't be a dream anymore and, and martin tried it and it didn't work and that maybe malcolm was a little bit more right you know maybe malcolm was right in in so far as what he said about 
what really needs to happen is America has to be brought forward on charges. The American government, I should say, has to be brought forward on charges to the United Nations or whatever the Geneva Convention or whatever organization we have that is a world sort of representative. They need to be brought forward for crimes against humanity. Mm. You know, Malcolm was murdered for that. Malcolm wasn't murdered. Again, take Malcolm's assassination into context. You have to know the circumstances surrounding his death. It wasn't just a jealousy beef with the Nation of Islam. It wasn't just that jealous black folks did him in or hated him for what he was saying. It's that Malcolm was now, from the time Malcolm left the Nation of Islam in 1963 to the point where he uh, took the Hajj that Muslims take once, at least once in their, they're required. See, this is the thing about Muslim religion. It's not just that Malcolm was a black Muslim. Malcolm was a Muslim who happened to be black. And he understood being a Muslim that every Muslim is required at least once in their lifetime to make what's called the Hajj or the pilgrimage to Mecca, which mm -hmm. is the epicenter of where Islam was born. And they have to do certain rituals. They have to make the seven circuits, I believe, of the Kabbal, Kabbalah. Excuse me, I might be getting that wrong. But they have to make the seven circuits. They have to pray to God where Muhammad play, prayed to God. There's all this stuff. And from the time that Malcolm did that, he ceased to be just a United States civil rights leader. Now he's on the world stage because he himself said, that was the first time I stood before the creator of all going to Mecca. That was the first time I stood before the creator of all and felt like a complete human being because I was worshiping God with brothers whose skin was whitest of white, whose hair was blonde and whose eye was, eyes was blue. And we were all brothers in one human, human family. He understood that when he went to Mecca. And now when he comes back, he's not talking about human rights he's, or, or civil rights. He's talking about human rights. And he's saying that the only way to bring America to justice for this is not to necessarily stage demonstrations and sit-ins and hope that the government sees what you're doing and says, oh, this is a travesty, this must stop. What do you do with a criminal? And according to America's own doctrine on the subject, what do you do? You give that criminal a trial. You put him on trial. You take your criminal to court. And if that, court, and if that criminal is found guilty in court, they must pay... Um, penance to the injured party to the fullest extent of the law. And so what's interesting about Malcolm in 65 is that um, on the day of his assassination, he had a piece of paper in his hand and he had, uh, he was prepared to read the names of the people that were involved in the conspiracy against his death. That's not finally the point. The point is what was Malcolm scheduled to do had he not been killed? That's the interesting part. Because if Malcolm is on the world stage, it's, not, it's no longer just about his beef with the Nation of Islam. Now he's being followed by the CIA. Now mm. he's being followed by the FBI. Now he's being tracked. Because we see him in Africa, in France, in uh, Mecca, in these other places being filmed, meeting with third world leaders who think like he does. Mm. That the Eurocentric colonization of the planet is, it needs to stop. And that black world leaders across the world are willing to work with him at that end goal. That's too much power. That's too much power. That's too much influence. That's too much unity. And Malcolm had a certain way about him that he was sort of a messianic figure. He just had that charis uh, the, the charisma about him to be that. So had he not been assassinated, and this is the thing that a lot of people don't know, he was scheduled to give a speech. And who, and who were some of the audience attendees of that speech? He was scheduled to give a speech within two days' time to uh, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, and other third world leaders to address um, the issue of their pulled leadership together to bring a case against the United States for its treatment of black people. Hmm. And they were going to put that, they were going to file a lawsuit at the foot of the United States Supreme Court against the United States. Don't you find it funny that he was killed before that could happen? 
Don't you find it funny that Dr. King was killed before he could execute a poor people's march on Washington that would have found America accountable for its financial discrepancies and redlining against not only poor blacks, but poor whites? It's never, what I'm saying with this is the racism issue at the end of it always feeds the socioeconomic power uh, uh, factor in, in, in this complex called America. The two go hand in hand. That train is almost never late. When you look at the black people that are killed and why, that are of prominence, I, sh I should say, it's not just random isolated incidences. And even now, I have to believe that the killing of black people is not by accident. It's for a reason. It's not just wild racist people. And if it is just wild racist people, then it's being used for an agenda of sorts. have to heal. We have to heal within our culture and then we have to heal with our white counterparts and then we have to all come to consensus that uh, it's like it's what Bruce Lee Bruce Lee's one of my favorite people of all time because his philosophy is really it, it, it's it's spot on and one of the things he said is is that under the sky and under the heavens there's but one human family. It just happens that we look different. But we're all one human family. And if we can get as black people to the place where people can see us not only as human beings, but as men and as women and be treated as such, then we can begin to talk about how as a group we've been shafted by the upper 1% and how to deal with that. Because the reality is, is that um, white privilege in and of itself would not be so horrible a thing if it were used to change the conditions of the society we currently live in, we could actually take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, it could be used to affect political change because we, as black people, we don't get to financially endorse our, our politicians like that. We simply don't have the resources. We never had them, but white people do. Joe Biden is endorsed by somebody that has money. Believe that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, even Bernie Sanders is endorsed by somebody who has money. You, your, 
your culture has that pull. The interesting thing would be is that they use that to say, okay, enough is enough. We have privilege, but let's use it to actually do some good. Since we're so hard on for America, mm -hmm. let's actually use it to turn it into America. Yeah. Let's actually be equal. Let's actually, um, I was watching a video earlier today and the black man on there, I don't know his name, but he spoke it far more eloquently than I ever could. He said, all we're asking you to do is be men of your word because that's what you taught us. Yeah. A man lives and dies by his word. That's what you taught us. So if that's true, all we're asking you to do is stand by your word. If you wrote that all men are created equal, stand on it and live by it and do right, not, nece not even necessarily by us, but do right by your very own words. Mm -hmm. You know, just do right by that and you'll be amazed at what people could be allowed to do and innovate and push the country further. You know, I'm an American. I'm an American as you're an American. So we both have a, a, a stake in this. We do have a stake in this. It's just different sides of the spectrum that we both need to understand about one another to figure out, okay, how do we take our shared experiences or actually, no, how do we take our different experiences and bring them together into a shared experience that we both can agree upon and use that shared experience to change our reality. Yeah. This this doesn't have this reality doesn't have to exist the, the way that it is. It's just we have to come together. And then as much as we are coming together, white folks have to kind of give black people the space to heal within their culture. You know, stop like I was, I was actually going to ask you what was your opinion of the looting and the rioting that was that was you know going on, or that has been going on. You know. Yeah, I. I mean, it's tough for me. I have two like uncles who are officers, mm -hmm. so I'm. I'm slow to get behind like the all cops are bad mm -hmm. hashtag and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand that the system that they're in is problematic, and I. It does. It's also just super frustrating too that you have all these outside agitators yeah. that are coming in and adding all this commotion on top of it. Yeah, and they're crisis actors. A lot of them. Yeah, yeah. and um, opportunists. Mm -hmm. I think. I don't know. At its core, I mean, I think most of these started as people peaceful protests. I don't think that, but it also seems like there's a lack of strong leadership in a lot of these instances. Yeah, I think that with the police to and you know just to speak to that for a second, the police I think the idea there is that the collective is the sum total of what it's chosen to feed. Mm. And what I mean by that is no not all cops are bad. But the ones that are being allowed to get away with what is clearly egregious yeah. are the ones being fed mm -hmm. by virtue of the fact that they're not receiving consequence for, t for uh, let, let, let's put it another, cause again, I'm, I'm going off of, you know, what, what you say and what you speak to has power. When you're talking about murdering somebody, you're, you're talking about the taking of their life. But the taking of the life is the end result. But you have to look at what fed that end result. What fed that end result is the disregard for another human life. That's what leads to murder. Yeah. That's, why, that's what makes murder so sick because it's premeditated. You've already made up your mind that you disregard that person's life enough that you feel is your right to take it. Mm -hmm. Life that you didn't give, you feel it's your right to take it because you despise their right to live so much. And so it's not necessarily that, you know, all cops are bad, but it's just that the ones that are actually upstanding officers of the law who do believe in protecting and serving, first of all, are not put on platform enough. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. They're not given enough of a platform to speak, but also there are some that are too silent even yeah. when they're given the platform. Yeah. And so when you're that silent, you're not feeding the other side. So there's a sense in which the militarized police unit is fat. It's engorged. It's like, it's got arthrosclerosis or whatever, you know, fattening of the artery walls. Yeah. It's so fat, right? <laughs> it's like- We, got they, no, we have no beast <laughs> police system. Right. Like, it's that's the fat one. The, um, the, uh, Oh, well, what's the term? The, the the thinner one, you know, sort of the amoebic one or the one that, anemic, that's mm-hmm. the one. The anemic one, the one that needs nourishment are the upstanding officers who actually do protect and serve their community. Yeah. The ones that actually look like the ones in their community that could go to the ones that's trying to cause trouble and say, no, I know him, he wouldn't do that. My father was a victim of that very same thing. Um, my My mother and father told me a story about when they were traveling from... I believe it was Ogden back toward Salt Lake and they got pulled over at uh, Davis County, the Bountiful area. They got pulled over in Bountiful. And this was, you know, back in the 60s, 70s period, that era. And uh, I believe it was probably the 70s by that point. But they got pulled over and the guy, the, the, the cop in question, was ready to take both my parents to jail because they fit, he according to the cop, mm-hmm. they fit the description of some kidnappers who had kidnapped a baby. They were ready to take him to jail. And the cop was, was white, right? And my dad, obviously, and my mom are black. You already see where this is going, mm-hmm. right? There was a police officer that my dad had went to school with and I can't remember now whether he was white or black. It doesn't matter. But the fact that he knew him and he was an upstanding officer, he was willing to speak on my father's behalf. And he said, no, I know that man. He would not do that. I went to school with him. It's, it's, it's policemen like that. Yeah. That diffuse the situation. They're the ones that deserve the platform. They're mm-hmm. the ones that deserve to speak on it. Yeah. And they're the ones that should be um, applauded and supported um, for what it is that they do. But the fact of the matter is we need more of them to actually intercede and let their integrity override the law in certain cases where it seems like the law is being abused. Because there's a, there's, you got to walk, I guess we all at some point have to walk this line between, you know, what is the law versus our, our integrity and our sense of what is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't fault the young lady who filmed George Floyd being murdered. I, 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 I resist the urge to say, well, you saw him down there. Why didn't you do something? She's a teenager. She's yeah. 16 and she's a young black female. Mm-hmm. If he's down on the ground with a knee in his windpipe, think of what would happen to her. Yeah. Worse. Mm-hmm. Because on top of the fact that she's black and young, she's female. And the most disrespected group in, in this society in my estimation, not only the female, but the black female. She is the most disrespected, unprotected quotient of society. It just so happens that now that even that truth is starting to flip. It used to be that the black woman was the most unprotected. Now we're starting to see the black male is probably the most disrespected you know and again that falls back into the equation that black people in general are the most disrespected people in american society Mm -hmm. and disregarded and disavowed so you know what more could she have she actually is the hero of the whole thing because she did the right thing by filming it yeah because had she not filmed it he'd be another statistic he would not be the catalyst that has sparked this second civil rights movement, mm-hmm. you know, and 
again, it's the death of a black male that's doing it. The first one was sparked by Emmett Till. You know, now we got another one by George Floyd. But there was also Breonna Taylor. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would include both of them. Yeah. Because Breonna Taylor, in a sense, was even worse. Because her home was just... She was shot in her home without a warrant. And really for no reason. Yeah. For no reason. A senseless death. So... Um, it, it seems like the only reason that one isn't focused on more... Well, and maybe you could argue that it's because she's a black woman, but mm -hmm. you don't have the the overt video evidence that's promoted like you did with George Floyd. Pro yeah, probably. Probably. But it makes... It doesn't it doesn't excuse or negate the reality that a, a, a black woman was killed in her home while she was asleep. No, absolutely not. It's just the, the shock reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... From that visual. And really at this point, you wouldn't need a lot of video evidence of anything. Mm -mm to understand that this is what reality for black people in this country is like. All you got to do is go pick up a, a, a book yeah. or, watch a, or watch a film. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see where the natural uh, trajectory of this interaction leads to. So even if we didn't have a video, at least from our perspective, you wouldn't need a video to believe that yeah. because it's common occurrence. Even now... And I try to uphold as much law as I can. But every time I see a police car behind me, there is a sense in which I suffer from anxiety because of that. Because I remember the discussions that my mom and my dad had with me when I was 16, where they were saying, okay, you're getting old enough now to where you have to be out on your own. In the event that you're pulled over, and you will get pulled over, Keep your hands on the wheel. Look forward at all times. Do not speak unless you're spoken to and always respond with yes, sir. And you do whatever you can to survive because they look at you and all they see, they don't even see that you're a teenager because of your size. They see a big, black, scary man and they're going to respond to you based on that. That's a, that's a real conversation that every black male at some point in their life, either between the ages of 8 and 16, that they have to have. Normally earlier. For me, it happened at 16. But for, for black boys now, it happens much earlier than it should. It shouldn't happen at all. But it happens much earlier than it should. White boys never have to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. They never have to have that conversation. And it's sad. Because for black people, that, that truth holds true for us, whether it's a white officer pulling us over or a black officer pulling us over. The fact that they're wearing a uniform, we have to be scared. Because we don't know in that instance whether we're going to come home or not. That's the reality for us. You know? And we do as best we can, but even those that abide, we've seen, uh, even abide by the law. Philando Castile had announced to the officers that were killing him that he had a license and he was reaching for it to show it to them when he was killed. Mm -hmm. But he had he had a conceal and carry license. You know, and he was murdered in front of his daughter. His daughter, we don't know what trauma his daughter will live with. Uh, and and, uh, and his girlfriend, I think, I uh, was his girlfriend or his wife, I think, or his significant other that was yeah. there with him. Mm -hmm. She watched him get blown away. You know, that's trauma. And we that's what we have to deal with. We have to deal with the reality of that. That for black people, inter interfacing and engaging the police is not, as I'm speaking ebonically, the police. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, engaging the police is always a, a life gamble. That's the conditioning that should change. Mm -hmm. I personally think that... Police officers should go through black anxiety training. Meaning that they should have to be put in the position to understand what it is they're putting black people through when they pull, pull them over. Hmm. There needs, they, they need to see the physical response measured. Yeah. You know? I mean, they do the same thing to the extent of having to like get tased and yeah. pepper sprayed. Yeah, yeah. To understand the trauma that they put someone through from that, but yeah, but I mean, like hook them up to cables, yeah, 
put them in a situation where they're being pulled over mm. and just gauge the mental and hormonal response. Yeah. You know, what's happening with the adrenal glands, mm -hmm. you know, that's what adrenaline is. It's a, a, the, the adrenaline is produced by the adrenal glands. It kicks the body into high gear because it thinks the body is about to get physical. Yeah. Fight or flight. Yeah. Right. And that adrenaline increases the cholesterol response in the body, makes the cholesterol go up. But the problem with that is, is that if that, especially for a black person, that unutilized cholesterol is what fuels the body. Because if you think you're going to get physical, you need oil lubricant to oil the muscles. Mm. That cholesterol after 72 hours of being unutilized turns bad clogging the arteries. Mm. Because of, of a stressful situation or an encounter with the police, you've now upped that black person's chances of dying of a heart attack at the age of 50. All from one stressful incident. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? They, yeah. that, that needs to be measured. Mm -hmm. That physical response needs to be measured. Because if people could see the numbers and... We all deal with stress, but we, we never seem to examine the effects of stress on the body. You know, all of the other uh, heart disease and all of that, all of that is byproducts of stress and anxiety. Mm. And what those, what, what adrenaline does to the body if it's not utilized. That's why we have hormones. So the hormones help us deal with the emotional response. But if we don't utilize that, it, it, it turns on us. It kills us. That's what an autoimmune disease is. Mm -hmm. it, it's the body attacking itself. So all of that stuff needs to be measured. Officers need to go through that kind of training. They actually need to be put in the experience of dealing with their own militarization. And then there needs to be demilitarization. There is no reason why, in order to deal with robberies, they should be having semi-automatic weapons. If you're that good of a, if you made it into the police force, you should be good enough of a shot to, to, to stop somebody who's stealing a purse or, or any of that stuff. You should be able to think on your feet to be able to figure out how to defuse certain situations without always killing being the last resort. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to shoot to kill. Shooting to kill should be reserved for terroristic incidences in my opinion where somebody has just killed a bunch of people and they got to go down before more people die that's that's the star trek um idealism played out in full right there yeah the needs of the many have to outweigh the needs of the few in that instance there i understand it mm -hmm. but a simple traffic stop you know or a shop theft or any you know the fact even that black people go are doing bids on 25 to life over weed come on man mm -hmm. you know and that stems from racism yeah. the, the, the movie reefer madness reefer madness has done more damage to america's concept of drugs and black people's association with it than anything else reefer madness and i remember i had to watch that film in grade school they showed it to us in grade school as like education as education wow. the, w when the whole dare thing was going on they showed us reefer madness and the whole point of reefer madness was they were basically telling white kids that if you smoke weed or or actually no look at the black guys smoking weed they'll get high and then they'll come after your, your uh white sisters and white daughters and get them high and start sleeping with them and then the race is polluted. Weed leads to all kind of debauchery. Not, you know, not even really explaining the fact that at that time, white people were already drawn to jazz musicians because they were cool anyway. Mm -hmm. The music was cool. The culture was cool. The clothes were cool. The language was cool. And on top of that, they're smoking weed. <laughs> so like, they're just having a good time. Well, who isn't drawn to a good time? <laughs> right, <laughs> so they were gonna smoke weed anyway, regardless of what we were doing. If it looked cool on top of everything else we were doing, they were bound to do it. But it was the fear of the debauchery behind it. Mm. And jazz music with black culture has jazz has always been synonymous with the debauchery of black culture. It just has been. Yeah, that's that 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 marriage has always gone hand in hand. Black artists through the years have tried to elevate it, but the fact of the matter is, is you don't have jazz without the blues you don't without those gutter bucket experiences of what we've been through 
you don't have it. You don't have it. So it always goes hand in hand. But I think what jazz did was it allowed us as a black culture to look at those bad parts of ourselves and still in some ways celebrate the beauty of life in it. Yeah. Not that life itself was grand and glorious, but at least we were alive to experience it. And that those little small joys that we had in, 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 in our days and in, in our existence, you know, the pot of collard greens, the bowl of macaroni and cheese, the meals, uh, yeah, my woman left me, but at least I got, you know, I got food, mm -hmm. you know, the blues, uh, uh, enabled us to, to dance over our depression and it gave America a musical art form be as, as a byproduct of that. But I mean, reefer madness is why we have the war on drugs. Every war that America has put on itself that is really is a war that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you know, like in the in the seventies, in the sixties, in the seventies, it was the war on poverty. Before the war on poverty, Sounds black like we people lost that one. There were, never was a war on poverty, <laughs> uh, and it, you're, you're right. Indeed, we lost it. But think about it: before the war, the so-called war on poverty, black people actually did quite well, because at least in the segregation era, black people controlled their own businesses. Mm. They had their own businesses. The dollar in the black community circulated X amount of times before it left that community to go to the white community. Now with the war on poverty, the, the, the dollar within the black community isn't even there all of eight seconds before it's left. Hmm. In the uh, white communities, and in particular the Jewish white communities, the dollar stays some 60 days before it leaves that community. That tells you right there <laughs> what's really what's really going on here. I mean, the war on drugs. Now we find out uh, through one of President Nixon's advisors from the period that the war on drugs was nothing but an excuse to imprison black revolutionaries. So now we find out why Huey Freeman and um, Stokely Carmichael and all these other guys that formed the Black Panthers wound up strung out on coke. It was implemented into the Panthers. Yeah. Right? That whole thing is a trip there. The, uh, a lot of people don't understand the Bloods and the Crips as gangs, you know, because we love to talk about black gangs and black violence. Well, they're, you know, all of the gang bang. The, the, the Bloods and the Crips came from offshoots of the Panthers, the Black Panthers. A lot of people don't even know that what the term crip means. Crip means community resistance and progress. Hmm. Officer. That's what that means. You know, that meant that if the, the police were harassing the citizens of a certain neighborhood, there was a community resistance in progress to come to the aid of those individuals that were being harassed by the police. That's what that meant. Hmm. But it got diffused once again. Once you start adding crack and, and cocaine into that type of organization and into those neighborhoods, now all of a sudden you got a drug, a war on drugs or a drug, drug epidemic. Now they're thugs. Now they're thugs. And initially they didn't care that crack and cocaine were killing black families. It was only when that crack and cocaine left the black community and started going into, white kids started doing crack and cocaine. Now all of a sudden, oh, it's a, it's a drug ep epidemic. We got a war on drugs. Mm -hmm. Really? Is it that we have a war on drugs or that you started a war on drugs that now has gone haywire because you started doing it? You know, there is no war on poverty and there is no war on drugs. What there is is a war on class. And these things, drugs and poverty, are the, are, are the weaponized tools of the richer, of the upper 1% mm -hmm. that they use to keep us fighting each other while they keep going to the bank. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's what's going on there. You know, so I, there's, there's a whole lot in the rabbit hole to go down with this. I mean, th th this conversation is multi-layered and multi-leveled. Uh, I'm happy to be having it with you though, but because mm -hmm. it needs to be discussed. But, uh, and the more, the more we discuss it, the more, like I said, we can heal within ourselves as a community and then, as a country come together and heal and then finally take this to Washington, D.C. Yeah. Because that's where the root of it is. That's the that's the, the center of it is Washington, D.C. and how Washington, D.C. responds mm -hmm. to it. And that's, 
you know, I believe that's ultimately how it's going to the play out will be there. Yeah. You know, the slat, the Trump standing out in front with the Bible proved that. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, this is incredibly helpful for me. I just, I think, yeah, we all have a duty right now just to be listening yeah. and trying to learn. And I so appreciate you sharing oh. all of this. I, I, I love talk. Hopefully I didn't talk too long, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I love talking. I love, I'm a student of history. You yeah. know, I love talking about history because it's only when you talk about your history and really get into the depth of that history that you learn how not to repeat it. Yeah. Or at least repeat the bad parts about it. For sure. The parts of the history that we need to repeat are the parts where we did um, where we did hard things because they were hard, you know, and we were uh, willing to look ourselves in the eye and be truthful and honest with ourselves and not delude ourselves, you know. Um, uh, Jeff Daniels did that one show where he talked about, you know, that video clip on YouTube where everybody was up in arms where he was talking about America is not the greatest country in the world. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he had that line. I, I love that line that he said, you know, we we weren't scared of intelligence. You know, we celebrated intelligence. We didn't belittle it. It didn't make us feel inferior. Mm -hmm. That line resonated with me because he's talking about education. Yeah. You know, we used to want, we used to be the society that was all about education and finding out the truth and being based on fact rather than feelings. And now it's the complete reverse. For sure. You know? But, but it's, it's been, it's been a joy to, to voice some some of how I think and hopefully people who have seen me in the public and or seen me playing or whatever probably hopefully now you have a deeper picture into my insight because I don't normally talk a lot on kids. yeah <laughs> I normally keep to myself a lot but hopefully you have a deeper insight into into you know Courtney Isaiah Smith and and what he thinks and and how he feels and and please understand I don't have it in my heart to hate people. I don't hate white people. I don't hate anybody, really. I don't really hate anybody, but I despise the actions that detriment society mm -hmm. and hurt us individually and collectively. So I, I believe it's possible to hate what's being done and not hate the person. Um, well, and actually, let me let me tailor that. I I strongly dislike the man who killed um, George Floyd because he he had evil intent. So it's hard for me to go to full on hatred, but I am leaning towards very 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 heated dislike. It it is <laughs> rageful dislike, and I think that's honest to say. Yeah. Um, hate. But I definitely hate the mechanism that produced that person. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to name him. But the mechanisms that produced that person, I hate that. I hate, I hate that. I hate the, those practices. Yeah. But I do not make it a notion of hating a people or hating a culture. As, especially one that you know I've lived amongst my whole life and sometimes still I don't fully understand. <laughs> right. You know, I don't, I don't hate. But what I do ask for is let us as black people let us be cranky for a little while mm -hmm. let us be cranky for a little bit we'll get back to you but but afford us being we we, we deserve after 450 years we deserve to be a little bit irritated yeah and we deserve to lash out and we do deserve to express our anger mm -hmm. let us do that for a minute and then come ready to listen to us and listen why we're angry and don't be so ready to come with suggestions but come with your presence as we figure out how to heal and ultimately at some point in you know coming going down the road rejoin you in a collected human effort to save our humanity. Yeah. Cause that's really what's at stake here. You know, the whole thing with the coronavirus and with, you know, China elevating itself to a superpower now eclipsing the United States. 
the potential dissolution of the United States, which which we really have to take seriously and look at. I, I'm really looking at it as this could potentially spark a second civil war. We could really see that in our lifetime, a second civil war. So we must, and, and that second civil war is against, it's going to redefine if it happens. It's going to re redefine what humanity is. It almost is like that Terminator plot, like from the Terminator. It, it is almost that. You know, it's like the humans versus the machines. It, it, it could get to that. Mm. So we have to redefine what humanity is. First of all, we have to see each other as human. We have to reprogram ourselves to say, hey, we all came from Africa. That doesn't mean we're all Africans nationally, but we came from Africans. But what that means is, is that we're all humans. Mm -hmm. The Homo sapiens came from Africa, so we're all humans. We're all humans and we all share at least the one common trait that all of us bleed red. You prick us, we bleed red. We might have different color eyes. We might have different color skin. We might have different body types. We might uh, even define ourselves uh, by different categories of like pronouns. Fine, great. That's the uniqueness of humanity is what makes it great, but also the shared collected human experience is what makes us great. And we cannot lose that part for the individual part. Yeah, for sure. Well, sweet. If you, <laughs> before we're done, if you just want to let people know about your music, where they can find you. So if you want to um, follow me on Instagram, it's uh, Izzy Smith, I-Z-Z-Y underscore S-M-I-F-F -F on Instagram. You can follow me, at, uh, Isaiah Smith on Facebook. Um, I have a SoundCloud, which is my, I believe my full name. Uh, Courtney Isaiah Smith on SoundCloud. You can go check out some beats that I've made there. You can check out the Mix the Band. Um, and I would also say uh, check out my 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 bandmate in uh, Jazzy Olivo. Check her her stuff out. She's she's helped me a lot in this in 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 this journey of rediscovering humanity and, and what. Uh, national pride because she's Dominican so mm -hmm. she's helped me discover what national pride re means and what it means to be proud to be black and that pro-black doesn't mean anti-white it just means pro-black it means I love myself first uh, so you know check her out Jazzy Olivo on uh, various social media and uh, um, keep uh, if you like what I've posted on Facebook so far please share it because um, I want it to go uh, viral I feel that if if it's spoken from an honest place, but from a place of, of, of love, of humanity, and wanting people to really understand what it is we're feeling, I believe that will speak more than some of the other methods. I believe, the spo I believe in the power of the spoken word and the written word. I believe that that touches people, and we probably have neglected it too long as a tool to affect change. Yeah. So, But follow me there, and um, I hope to read comments from you guys or run into you guys out in public as safely as possible but you know um i'm hoping that this podcast will reach lots of people and that hopefully anything that i've said will add to the positivity of the discussion and not the negativity and, um, I'll, I'll end by paraphrasing my hero malcolm x if i brought any light if i brought any truth and i've you know, illuminated any idea that will shed the light on this disease and will help eradicate this disease of racism, uh, then all credit is due to God and only the mistakes have been mine. Thanks so much, Courtney. Thank you. That does it for this two-part episode featuring Courtney Isaiah Smith. The song you're listening to is The For Real Though. It's one of the many awesome beats Courtney has available on his SoundCloud. You can find links to that and everything else that he mentioned at thehappymusicians.com. There we have posts for every episode that we've done, and each post includes lists of the actionable advice that the artists share, as well as links to things they reference, where you can find their music and their social media pages, and more about the artists. You can also find us on social media at The Happy Musicians. And if you use our hashtag Happy Musician on Instagram, you can be featured in our story. And you can also just help spread a message of pursuing music in a positive and healthy and a happy way. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. 
hope you will continue to educate yourself on these issues and have tough conversations with your family and your friends. Black Lives Matter. Thanks for being here. Stay happy.